web from the Australian Academy of Science. I'd like to begin by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land on which we meet today. For me, it's the Yagra people. I would also like to pay my respects to elders past and present. This event is the first in a series of six COVID-19 events being delivered by the Australian Academy of Science in collaboration with the Department of Industry, Science, Energy and Resources. These events are delivered under the Australian Government's Regional Collaborations Program, which increases international scientific collaboration through research and innovation. Each event in the series will delve into research that is helping to fight the COVID-19 pandemic and feature researchers from three different countries. Tonight, we'll hear from Japan, South Korea, and Australia, to begin, please welcome the Australian Ambassador to Japan, Ms. Van Adams. Hello, and thank you for attending this unique science and digital technology event. As clearly reflected by Prime Minister Morrison's visit to Japan a few weeks ago, Australia and Japan have a strong and enduring special strategic partnership. This partnership has many threads including our close cooperation in science and research. And indeed, 2020 marks the 40th anniversary of the signing of the Australia-Japan Science and Technology Treaty. So it's heartening to see that Australia and Japan continue to collaborate bilaterally to overcome the worst pandemic in a century. The world is looking to science to provide us with the tools to solve these significant problems. This, of course, includes the world's fastest supercomputer at Riken in Japan. I hope that today's event is a fruitful opportunity to share information and to make new connections that deepen Asia-Pacific science collaboration. Best wishes. Please welcome the Australian Ambassador to the Republic of Korea, Mr. James Boy. Congratulations to the Australian Academy of Science for hosting today's webinar on supercomputing addressing COVID-19. The Australia-Korea science relationship is an important one, underpinned by a treaty level agreement between the governments of Australia and Republic of Korea, signed in 1999. Science and technology exchanges between our two countries are growing and form a core part of our long-standing bilateral relationship. And indeed, in 2021, we will celebrate the 60th anniversary of diplomatic relations. Last year, Australia and Korea held the fourth Joint Committee on Science and Technology in Canberra. Pleasingly, we agreed to further collaborate on research on artificial intelligence to counter infectious disease. In the context of the ongoing pandemic, today's webinar is very timely and an excellent starting point for this collaboration. Both South Korea and Australia have won international praise for their responses to COVID-19. We both have lessons and findings we can share with one another, including at today's event, which I hope will inspire further exchanges between researchers from both Australia and Korea. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ambassador. Now to our audience, you'll have the opportunity to ask questions to our speakers so if you have a question, please email events at science.org.au or contact us on Twitter at tag, uh, tag at Science Academy and use the hashtag fightingcov2. Now, the COVID-19 pandemic has created one of the most difficult scientific challenges of the 21st century. And in the race to understand and stop the spread of the virus, Scientists are using the world's most powerful computers. These supercomputers are analysing an endless stream of data that is being generated every second of every day and involves hundreds of countries. And these incredibly powerful computers are being used to help scientists solve a variety of problems and understand COVID-19 better. Joining me this evening to discuss this important topic is Professor Satoshi Matsuoka, Director of the Riken Center for Computational Science from Japan, 
We also have distinguished professor Kerry Mengerson from Queensland University of Technology. She's also the director of the Centre for Data Science and a fellow of the Australian Academy of Science. And due to unforeseen circumstances, our original speaker from Australia, Associate Professor Megan O'Mara, can no longer join the event. Also with us this evening is Dr. Dae Yon Chow, the Director of the Smart City Innovation Program from the Korea Agency for Infrastructure Technology Advancement. Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us. First up, we'll start with you, Professor Matsuoka. Now, the world's largest supercomputer, Fugaku, is in Japan. And it's been used to analyze dozens of prospective COVID-19 remedies. Can you tell us about how Fugaku has supported COVID-19 research? Well, Fugaku basically is a very large supercomputer, has immense capability to simulate various phenomena, you know, uh, in using physical means or with AI and so forth. Um, if you divide the type of research that has been done on Fugaku, there are just there are two kinds. The one type would look at viruses as molecular structures or you know, collection of atoms. In that sense, you would look at the um, COVID-19 um, uh, uh, proteins that uh, consist the uh, COVID-19 as individual atoms and collection of atoms. And you try to simulate how they behave how they uh, how humans how they contact with the human cells to cause disease infections, and also what kind of drugs would be uh, utilized to prevent such infections from happening. The other would be more macroscopic type of research, that is to say, uh, more epidemiological, societal type of simulations. For example, you know, these um, uh, viruses are carried in droplets that are basically output from the mouth when people cough or speak. So uh, you would do this um, uh, droplet simulations, how they behave, you know, when they come to the mouth, um, how you can shield it with mouth, uh, with mask and so forth, to all the way to even more macroscopic phenomena, such as uh, see, um, basically trying to simulate the effects of uh, societal lockdowns and how they affect the economy overall. So uh, there are a variety of research that's being done to analyze how these infections, the uh, pandemic is spreading and how we may have uh, means to prevent them. And so what are the advantages of using supercomputers for this type of research compared to say regular computers? Well, a lot of these simulations that we're performing on these, uh, on Fugaku is so immense that it would take um, a standard supercomputer, um, you know, months, years, or even multiple years to, uh, to complete. For example, in our search for uh, uh, therapeutic drugs, we're looking at surveying to over 2,000 prescriptive drugs, so they can be um, basically repurposed to be to uh, to see if they're effective for COVID-19. Not just antiviral drugs, but you know um, any any sort of drug that can be uh, prescribed. But doing a very detailed studies of these um, uh, molecular uh, substances takes many, many, many computing cycles. And that if we had run this on our previous machine, the K computer, just you know, running these 2,000 substances on just one target, and you know, and virus has many targets you can you could target drugs to, but just one target would have taken more than a year. Whereas on Fugaku, it takes just three days. So, you know, using the, these immense power of uh, world's fastest supercomputer basically allows us to come up with solutions in time instead of years, you know, waiting for 10 years, and by that time, the whole crisis will be over. Wow, that's incredible. For something that would take a year takes only three days. So obviously it's much needed mm. in this uh, global fight against this public health problem that we've all got. Professor Mengerson, you're a statistician and data science, and you've been using supercomputers from around the world to understand global patterns of infection of COVID-19. What have you found? Thank you. Yes, we've, I'm a statistician, I'm a data scientist uh, here in Australia, and uh, we've been working in a global collaboration, an international collaboration, looking again at this uh, macroscopic level. So we have uh, looking at epidemiological 
stochastic epidemiological models in about 103 different countries, trying to understand the rates of infection, the patterns of infection in these countries. And again, this is like large simulation-based approaches uh, underpinned by uh, mathematical and statistical methods. So taking the data that we have, the diverse types of data, and being able to analyze that, combining it with our statistical model in the computer power. So we're doing this with in, across Europe and also in the US. Uh, and so in Europe, for example, there is a, uh, a new group that's funded uh, uh, from the, um, the Horizon 2020 uh, grant. And this involves 34 different countries uh, to be able to model uh, the different kinds of data um, across those different kinds of um, problems from the drug discovery through to the psychological impacts of COVID uh, on individuals and populations. So we absolutely need the supercomputers in able to be able to be able to combine these things. So this is scientific collaboration on a global scale of which we've never seen before with an overload of information coming in every second of every day. What are some of the challenges that you've faced? Yeah, there's a number of challenges, of course, about the size of the data and also the diversity of the data. But there's also challenges, for example, in the privacy of the data. And so uh, when we're looking at even within a country, we need to take account of the privacy of the data and the provenance of the data. But then when we include different countries, and that just amplifies the problem. Now, we need the computers, the supercomputers, to be able to, uh, to accommodate those kinds of privacy issues. And uh, that adds another layer to the, uh, the supercomputer. That's all very interesting. Dr Chow, at the beginning of the pandemic, South Korea had the most confirmed cases after China. How did it manage to flatten the curve so quickly? Yeah, uh, actually, I am uh, I'm not a computer scientist, but uh, actually I am uh, in charge of a smart city program in our country. So basically, I can explain the background of these uh, pandemic situations. Uh, at the beginning of uh, a pandemic situation, it ha uh, happened in early February, uh, middle of February uh, this year. Uh, in Daegu. So uh, Daegu is uh, our demonstration uh, site of a smart city project. So I can explain uh, smart city concept. Uh, for example, uh, we, we can say about the service of smart city solutions, but in our program, we uh, restructuring the smart city uh, framework. Uh, for example, we can connect the physical infrastructures and the cyber spaces and we can get from uh, infrastructure uh, through the network systems so we uh, we develop we are we were developing the uh, management system is like a platform uh, to connect uh, different data at one uh, system so we developed this data of system last year so uh, that's the beginning of the uh, connection, this data of system to the Korea uh, center of disease control. So we propose these kinds of uh, data of system to KCDC and they, uh, they determined to uh, use uh, these kinds of uh, uh, data of system for against uh, uh, COVID-19 uh, spread. Uh, so uh, we can use uh, telecommunication data and the credit card data uh, under the law of uh, infectious uh, disease uh, control and uh, prevention act so they guarantee some use of this uh, data, uh, private uh, private data so after we can check the uh, confirm the patient and then we uh, tracing the we can trace the uh, past uh, uh, fourteen days uh, uh, is a movement. So we connect the, this data at one system, and we can check the uh, the possibility of uh, uh, another uh, potential uh, 
uh, epidemic, uh, potential uh, COVID-19 happen happening. So we can uh, make some network analysis and uh, sometimes we can uh, it's announce uh, some possibility of uh, uh, dangerous place and uh, we can uh, make some information to the public and uh, the local government. So uh, our government uh, thinking about the three uh, treatment, uh, three T's, one is uh, uh, quick test and the uh, second is quick uh, quick tracing and the third one is uh, quick treatment that is the uh, secret of our threatening COVID-19. So just to clarify this data hub was already set up and that allowed South Korea to get ahead of this curve and flatten it by an, an amazing testing and sort of tracing method. How was how are supercomputers used to as part of this response? Uh, actually, I'm not sure about uh, the use of supercomputing, but uh, because we're thinking about the connectivity of computing, so uh, sometimes we can use uh, uh, artificial intelligence solutions for uh, testing, and we uh, develop some uh, detection uh, kits. Uh, sometimes we can use a cloud computing system of uh, uh, a great telecommunication company and other data stores. And uh, I, I think uh, there, that is a cloud computing uh, system is very important for uh, big data analysis. Okay, thank you very much. Now, Professor yeah. Matsuoka, the Fugaku supercomputer is still being built. In fact, it wasn't supposed to be ready for use until 2021. How did your team manage to fast track its use? Well, you know, Fugaku, has been in development for the past 10 years. You know, uh, we just started the conception of the machine when the last predecessor to Fugaku, the K-computer, was just about to be completed. So, you know, it took a long time to design it and took a long time to you know, build and you know, manufacture and place it onto our center. But, uh, you know, at the very last stage of the manufacturing placement, this whole COVID thing happened. So naturally, uh, you would think of uh, trying to uh, fast track the machine in order to actually fight against it because after all, Fugaku was designed to be an application's first machine. We didn't build Fugaku to be, you know, uh, number one machine in benchmarks, although it is, uh, you know, it, we built it so that it'll be useful to the society. And when you do that, a lot of people think that building a supercomputer just involves, you know, designing hardware and such. But actually, uh, designing a supercomputer, and which is useful for application, wide-ranging applications, um, some of which have been described, um, takes a development of the high-performance software itself. Because you know, Shivaka is this huge machine. It has 8 million CPUs in, this, in the whole system. It's larger than you know, standard cloud you see out there. So um, a lot of um, simulations and uh, now analytics uh, um, programs that are running to fight COVID have been repurposed from the application research. For example, the droplet and aerosol simulation that has been really been useful to educate the public, but also to analyze the very situation, which is regarding transmission, where not in a very you know, unprecedented detail, has been repurposed from studies on fuel injection in internal combustion engines. You know, the, the research team said, hey, you no, know, the team has been working on doing fine grain uh, fuel injection research on you know, with uh, partnering with uh, automotive companies. And suddenly they realize, hey, this is the same physics as people coughing and, you know, spewing droplets to lure. So, so you know, being doing all this research, not just focusing on hardware, but being application first, focusing on science, focusing on, on the applications, allowed us to fast track our research to combat COVID-19. And what other areas of research regarding COVID-19 has Figaku been focusing on besides the droplets? <clears throat> well, like I said, you know, we're looking at uh, drug design, therapeutics, um, that's, and also basic understanding of how these infections occur. And there are lots of details, you know, there are lots of mechanics involved with respect to the virus, you know, attaching, uh, basically penetrating the human cells to multiply itself to use basically human cells as a factory. And it's very delicate, and these cannot be captured by uh, standard instruments. I mean, they can capture snapshots, but the motions, for example, of the of the of the atoms and proteins 
to actually dynamically attach itself cannot be seen, observed in any instruments. So uh, simulations provide missing links. And uh, uh, the other is, um, we're uh, on a very macroscopic level, we're trying to uh, find out what's, um, you know, people have contact tracing applications in many countries, including uh, Korea, Japan, so forth. But um, how do we use it effectively? Um, how, what's the percentage of population that really need to have this uh, uh, installed in smartphones? And in what way for these to be uh, effective? And, um, the, and so we're simulating the actual populations of humans and their activities equipped with um, these um, some contact tracing applications in the virtual world and seeing uh, how they're effective. Like, for example, what, uh, what would be most effective? Now, what's the effective time from the actual infection to the notification? Would these contact tracing applications be effective? Is it can it be delayed by 12 hours, one day, three days? We don't know until we release uh, simulate the scenarios, and we've done that to help the government. So a lot of uh, Fugaku's results have been used to come back, to fed back to the Japanese government, uh, which have resulted in uh, government policies to combat uh, COVID-19. That's pretty interesting information. So it's been using, uh, it's being used for a wide range of different research. So the big question is, how fast is Fugaku and how does it compare to other supercomputers? Well, um, firstly, you know, it's faster than, it's three to five times faster than any other supercomputer in the world including the American ones, the you know, Chinese ones, and, and so forth. Um, to put this, it's an exascale machine, meaning, you know, it can do 10 to the 18 calculations. But, you know, to put this in perspective, you know, if you, uh, everybody has a smartphone, right? And um, the Fugaku can run the same program as you would in a smartphone because it run, has the same, uh, because uh, the CPUs in Fugaku run, can run the same, what's called ARM instruction set. Every smartphone has an ARM. Once a Samsung produces Apple, so so. However, the power is completely different. So the uh, Fugaku is, is equivalent to about 20 million smartphones, which wow. is about the same number of smartphones sold in Japan over the course of a year. So, yeah, that's the capability of Fugaku. That's a very interesting statistic, uh, Professor Mengerson. Can you tell us about Australia's supercomputer environment? How does it compare, and how does it help scientific discovery? Australia has a national computational infrastructure uh, that is the, the custodian for the, the national uh, computing uh, facilities. And the new uh, supercomputer that we have available now is called Gardi. And so Gardi is, uh, came on board about November last year and uh, had a, a large range of users in about January this year. And so um, so uh, in about March, April of this year, then uh, there was a large call for uh, COVID-19 rapid response on Gardi. And, uh, and so in about June of um, this year, then Gardi was about number 24 in the, in the world, ranked number 24 in terms of supercomputers. And so it's now one of the, uh, the was invited to be part of the, um, the NCI PAUSI US-led uh, COVID-19 HPC clusters or, or consortiums. And so it's one of the elite computers in the world. So Australia is very fortunate to have this really uh, elite uh, computational resource. So Gardi itself then has about 155,000 CPU cores. And to give you some idea about how fast it is, it runs about 9.26 quadrillion calculations Per second, and so that's about a about seven hundred million hours of calculations uh, will be completed in in twenty twenty. Now, to put this in perspective, some of the uh, the areas, for example, our modelling, but also in drug discovery, uh, take a lot of um, computational time. So, for example, one of the people at ANU, um, Megan O'Mara has been looking at some drug discovery work and her work uh, includes about, um, she has to do uh, simulations on about 800,000 atoms in order to be able to do the kind of um, uh, 
the drug discovery work and the molecular work that she's interested in. So this actually takes, at the molecular level, to be able to analyse these data, takes about 13 million hours of computing. And if you were to do this at a single sort of calculation on a usual computer, it would take about 1,500 years. And so, you know, we can trade these stories on how, on how much uh, capability the supercomputers give. But basically, we're looking here at something like, uh, you know, two weeks of computing instead of 1,500 years. And so this is just something that is completely enabling to understand uh, the, the drug discovery, the modelling, and now just the, um, the, the, uh, the escape from COVID, what's going to happen at a population level if we're modelling at the macro scale about how people might move around, as we've been talking about here. So we're fortunate in, um, in Australia to have Gardi, and we also have another system, Pawsey, which is coming on board in a couple of years' time. It'll be about twice as fast as, um, as Gardi, and uh, it'll put us in the sort of the 20 to 30 uh, world ranking in terms of supercomputers. Now, those kind of statistics are, are mind-boggling for the average person. But um, it obviously shows why there is just such a, an important need for supercomputers, but they're not cheap, are they? Can you explain why it's important to invest in supercomputers, invest in scientists who can use them, and also to keep updating them? As we've seen through a lot of the work that we've been talking about here, how do we respond to a pandemic uh, like COVID-19 how do we respond to bushfires? How do we respond to these uh, challenges that are impacting on our society um, if we don't have the supercomputer resources? So Australia needs to invest as the world needs to invest. We need to form then regional partnerships so that we can uh, take advantage of the, the collective uh, compute power but then, and to also learn from each other about our responses to these kinds of um, these kinds of challenges, we also need to invest in the people, the people to to manage these resources, and also then to the scientists who can can uh, take advantage of the compute power. And for we also need to have um, good data scientists as well who are going to be able to uh, manage and to analyze the data that we. These vol this volume of information, if we're to take advantage of it, we need people to manage the supercomputers, we need people to be able to analyse it, and we need scientists to be able to, uh, to, to take advantage of that and translate it to, to solve these challenges that we're facing like COVID-19. Now, Professor Mengerson, you've been working in this area for about three decades. Obviously, you would have seen a great many changes. Can you just tell us about some of the changes you've seen and some of the improvements that you've seen? Does it blow your mind as well as everybody else's? Of course. So um, one of my first uh, jobs uh, as of a, when I was at university was to in a bank uh, to go around the bank personnel and ask why would you need a desktop computer? So you take, you know, 30 years ago asking people why would they even need a computer to now the kinds of supercomputers that we've been talking about here that we absolutely rely on to do science and to solve these kinds of or to address the kinds of pandemics we're seeing like COVID-19. Um, we see now that we are going to, to need this increasing compute power as we go forward and to understand then how we meet those challenges of the data that we're collecting, the size of the data, the scale of the, the computational uh, challenges, and then to understand how we might better deal with that. So through federated um, distributed learning, through other kinds of platforms, through using um, uh, cloud computing and so on. So the future is very exciting. Come this amazing ride through uh, from from you know thir in the last thirty years, and it will be amazing for the next thirty, I'm sure. Yeah, I'm sure too. It's hard to even imagine the scope and power that supercomputers are going to have in the future. Now, Dr. Chow, can you tell us a little bit more about South Korea's Smart City Data Program and how that is being used in the fight against COVID nineteen, and perhaps some of the collaborations that have been happening with other countries? Uh, actually, uh, after 
uh, we, we call it EISS. EISS is Epidemiological Investigation Supporting System. So many countries are interested in this EISS. So basically, uh, it is very difficult to uh, apply uh, Korean system to other countries because we have uh, uh, some uh, uh, strong uh, infrastructure and governance system. So, uh, for example, uh, our national government can control the whole the, uh, data usage of, uh, uh, for example, uh, for the public health. Uh, in special cases, uh, we can use the uh, personal data, but uh, normally it is very difficult to use uh, some personal data. So, we uh, we make some uh, smart city data hub system and we demonstrate uh, this system in a uh, small city and another large city so it is i think it is the initial time of a smart city data hub uh, system uh, using uh, uh, and uh, we try to connect the many different kinds of uh, uh, data from uh, each silo so uh, recently we're thinking about how how can we expand this usage of smart city data system to other areas, for example, mobility and uh, energy management system and environmental uh, management also. So uh, nowadays we focus on the uh, how can uh, standardize uh, uh, these kinds of smart city data system and how can we open this uh, architecture to the public. So that is our uh, concerns for smart city data system. Okay. And what are the next steps for South Korea and the use of the city's data? Are there other uses for health? Yeah, actually, we, our government tried to the two kinds of pilot uh, smart city uh, project. Uh, one is uh, uh, for Sejong and the other is uh, uh, Busan. We uh, build a new uh, smart city uh, until 2023 so we tried the uh, the many kinds of first industrial revolution technology for example autonomous vehicles and robotics and uh, artificial intelligence also so we make a town and we tried many uh, kind of innovative uh, innovative solutions to these uh, these areas so basically, we're thinking about the high performance computing system for uh, smart cities because, uh, uh, you know, the autonomous vehicle uh, is uh, produce uh, so many big data uh, uh, at short time. So how can we connect these kinds of big data to the central system and the cloud edge system also? And how can we analyze and visualize uh, uh, these kinds of activities uh, on the city? Uh, in a digital uh, digital twin model, so that is another challenge for uh, smart city systems. Okay, that's a lot of interesting information. Now, Professor Matsuoka, back to you. Has Figako been predominantly used for Japanese research, or has it been a truly global collaboration? Well, you know, so far Figako is pre-production. So, of course, individual scientists may have a global collaboration that they do. Uh, we have collaborations else, everywhere, you know, UK, like uh, uh, the, uh, the weather, uh, HMWF, which is uh, one of the premier uh, climate uh, 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 climate centers. Uh, we have a lot of collaboration with DOE, uh, USDOE. Um, we have collaboration with uh, Singapore, which just announced, um, uh, where Singapore scientists also using Kraken. But so far, predominantly, because we're still pre-production, majority of the workflows have been uh, rather focused on uh, the workloads that have been utilized to design Fugaku in the first place. I remember that uh, you know Fugaku was designed to be application first, so applications were developed in co-design with the machine itself. Uh, but as Fugaku will come to deployment, um, uh, firstly, um, it will be open to all the scientists in the world, um, uh, uh, as long as they're useful, peaceful purposes, including, of course, COVID-19. We're also a member of the COVID-19 coalition. So um, we are hoping that uh, uh, our capabilities will be utilized worldwide uh, in order to solve these uh, hardest problems. And also, you know, Fogaku you know, is not a, you know, we didn't develop our technologies 
just for Fugaku alone. You know, at the end of the day, Fugaku is a huge, he's a humongous machine. It's, it's, it's just huge. You know, it's like uh, occupy 3,000 square meters of space. Yeah. Um, 160,000 chips and 8 million nodes. But, um, you know, at, at the end of the day, just one machine. Uh, but the technology we have developed um, hopefully will permeate to other infrastructures, other supercomputers, other clouds, and so forth. Because on one hand, you know, we, you know, we have the most advanced CPU in the world. On the other hand, it's the most general purpose. Like I said, it runs the same program as we run a smartphone or like, um, you know, the latest Mac M1, the Macintosh MacBook M1 runs the same code. Um, modified, modify. so it can be utilized. Uh, for example, um, yeah, we may be able to put the, the entire smart city virtually in Sakugaku. Have virtual sensors, virtual Adrenos, tens of thousands of them populated within the smart city, and uh, simulate um, uh, what would go on, and then and then bring them out. So you know, the collaboration like that, for example, as uh, Dr. Cho mentioned, uh, could be really essential to solve some of these. Um, uh, crisis, but also to really make the world more efficient. So uh, we're really open to these types of collaborations uh, on Fugaku. So it's just basically like a bunch of um, new Macintosh computers or iPhones. Oh, yeah. Um, in fact, we had uh, high school students come in. It was a contest, and they, they had used, and we told them, no, it's, it may be real fast, but it's just like your PC. It, it'll feel like your PC. And they came back and said, yeah, yeah, um, you're right. It was like on my PC, but, you know, it's immensely fast. So that's what it really takes. Um, you know, and that's really important because you want, you know, because at the end of the day, it's all the software that's important. And uh, the software pieces, if run on these big machines, but also can be run on the edge devices to PCs, to workstations, and so forth, will immensely broaden the capabilities of these machines. Because what you develop on your laptop can be, you know, multiplied by hundreds of thousands on these machines. So, you know, um, so I think that type of generality will really advance the, you know, society for the future. And but that was the most difficult challenge for us. You know, how can you design a chip which is you know, two, 20 million smartphones worth, but you know, can run the same code? That's that's hard. Generality and the performance usually do not uh, coexist. Yeah, that's very smart and incredible technology. Professor Mangerson, why is Australia's supercomputer called Gaddy? Uh, I don't know. <laughs> Sorry about that one. <laughs> okay. Um, look, is there anything else that you can tell us about uh, some of the research that uh, Australia's supercomputer is doing towards uh, fighting COVID? Uh, so in, within COVID, uh, COVID applications, it's mostly around the, uh, the uh, drug discovery. So looking at, um, at how the, 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 uh, the virus behaves um, and um, under different kinds of um, epidemiological and uh, clinical responses. Uh, so there's a lot of that kind of thing. Also, the work on the epidemiology is talked about. Uh, there's also work on bioinformatics and also inflammatory responses. <coughs> and it's already been talked about too. The work of uh, of uh, looking at air quality and droplets, and um, and the droplet uh, work is uh, being undertaken in the university here uh, in a large global consortium, but also with our international laboratory for air quality and health. And so a lot of this work is around um, the, the, um, the role of droplets and then the, um, the impact on health. And as has been said, that, uh, that is a, a large computational problem. Um, as has also been said, a lot of this work borrows from, uh, from other areas. And so our supercomputers are used, for example, on other big challenges like bushfires and of course, uh, astronomy. And so we have, uh, you know, we have a, a range of different areas that require the, the, uh, the sort of the advantages and the, the abilities that we have through um, our supercomputers. So Australia is really leading in some of these areas. Uh, we are very fortunate to have this, uh, this great uh, compute power and this asset in Australia that's really enabling for Australian scientists. And as others have been saying, you know, part of the, uh, the endeavor here is to have this collaboration with other countries 
and to be able to place Australia on a global stage to be able to solve issues like COVID-19 um, internationally. Well, thank you for explaining that. Now, we're opening the discussion to people watching. So if you have a question, please email <coughs> events at science.org.au or contact us on Twitter, tag at science underscore academy and use the hashtag fighting cove2. That's fighting cov2. Now, we do have some questions from the public, including that uh, tricky one about Gaddy. Sorry about that, Professor Mengerson. Um, but first up, Let's just go to Professor Matsuoka. Now that supercomputers okay. have been used to research various elements of COVID-19, has it opened up new applications for other research? Well, you know, there are, you know, we publicize the COVID-19 research so much uh, for basically for public good. In fact, that's not us. If you look at all the media coverage of uh, our simulations in Japan is just uh, astounding. And I think that was for the good because uh, that really, um, for example, drop simulation really allow visualizations of these uh, viruses, which are otherwise invisible, to really warn the public, you know, it's not a, you know, this is really a very tricky beast to deal with. So you've got to wear masks and ventilate and so forth. But having said that, um, um, you know, there are tons of other research being done on Fugaku other than COVID. And uh, uh, it's some, um, but sometimes the public thinks you know Fuku is used being used exclusively for COVID, but of course that's not true. So uh, we're using Fuku even now as I speak to solve some of the hardest problems, uh, like in medicine, like curing can like um, uh, curing cancer, um, doing various gen uh, genetic analysis of uh, uh, various uh, cancer cells uh, for disaster prevention, um, you know, from uh, like typhoons or uh, or uh, earthquakes to a very long-term um, um, uh, uh, sustainability studies like climate, uh, long-time climate studies for energy uh, generation, transmission to storage, batteries, new, more efficient type of uh, energy generation. Um, and, you know, for uh, manufacturing. Um, and again, this is from very microscopic, from new materials. Um, do novel materials to uh, things as large as a huge uh, tankers because um, uh, you see virtual wind tunnels to design airplanes, but hasn't been uh, virtual um, pools for studying these um, uh, for for uh, designing large ships because it turns out these simulations have been very difficult on smaller machines. But now we have the capability, so. Um, uh, all these research uh, hopefully will really advance the society, um, and we call it like society 5.0, uh, IT na enabling the new uh, new realm of society. And um, uh, this will probably have a permeating uh, impact, not just you know, to Japan, but you know all over the world. And um, hopefully that will uh, better the mankind. Okay, thank you. That was very interesting. Now, I do have a, a follow-up from some viewers about what the word gadi means. Apparently, it's an Aboriginal word. Uh, it's named after the words to search for in the Ngunnawal Ngun language, which is in and around the area near Canberra. So uh, back to you, Professor Mengerson. What is the importance of fundamental research in giving us a head start and allowing scientists to adapt in times of crisis? A lot of the work that we do is, uh, in, in, uh, even though it's in very different areas, uh, there's a fundamental and underpinning similarity in the kinds of problems. And so, for example, if we're looking at the mathematical underpinnings of, uh, of molecules and then we're looking at mathematical biology, then that work can be translated across different fields. But even within that, then, the way that the mathematics works and the fundamentals of the mathematics uh, can then be translated to areas of environmental and conservation. It can be translated to areas of digital twins. It can be um, translated to areas of autonomous vehicles and so on. And so understanding this fundamental research, if it's in mathematics or if it's in chemistry, if it's in, uh, if it's in other areas of science, is really important because that forms the underpinnings, the building blocks through which we can translate from one area of, uh, of science and knowledge through to another area. 
And so we find that we can work in very different diverse areas, but we still have the same underpinning uh, fundamental scientific knowledge. So we need that kind of uh, investment in the fundamental science in order to be able to create the building blocks through which then we can have these applied areas and these applied uh, translation of knowledge uh, that then meets the kinds of challenges we see through bushfires, COVID and so on. Okay, another question from a viewer that has written into us for you, Professor Mengerson. Are quantum computers the next step or are they something completely different? No, there's a lot of work in quantum computers and it's a very exciting area of, uh, of research. Australia actually has a strong investment in, com in quantum computers as well uh, through the, uh, the national um, computational infrastructure, but also through our Australian Research Council uh, discovery grants and through the other, uh, the other granting bodies. So we have a range of researchers working in the quantum computing area as well. It's an exciting future. Great. Now, Dr. Chow, we've got a question for you from someone online. They're asking, why is data standardisation so important? Is there a role for supercomputer facilities to encourage countries to work together to standardise their data? So, actually, uh, you know, the, in the case of uh, uh, Smart City, uh, we, uh, we can... Uh, analyze the, the many kinds of uh, systems, for example, transportation and energy systems. In the case of transportation, we, we can think about the mobility of bus and uh, subway system and personal mobility also. So many cities uh, adopted uh, uh, different kinds of uh, systems and platforms. So uh, the best way uh, for smart city is to uh, normalize and standardize of data set uh, from each systems uh, uh, because it it can uh, save the money and save the resources uh, for the different uh, development so we should pursue the standardization of data set and data uh, is a framework so uh, in the case of supercomputing, uh, for example, you know the uh, city is a very complex system. So it, it's like a system of systems. So how can we connect and how can we guarantee the interoperability of uh, uh, each function? So uh, the standardization is the uh, the basic uh, fundamental fundamentals to uh, attain the goal uh, for smart cities. So. Uh, I, I think the uh, in the case of autonomous vehicle and other uh, mobility uh, is a tools are uh, the another uh, big challenge for standardization for smart cities. Yes. Okay, that's very interesting. Now, Professor Matsuwaka, we've got a question for you from someone who has written in online. Where is okay. the line between science and technologists when we're talking breaking edge supercomputers? Well, that's a difficult question uh, because, you know, you know what's science versus technology has always been a sort of a, you know, very deep philosophical question. I consider myself both a scientist and engineer because I do, you know, my, my activity spans across both. I think, you know, um, uh, so science in terms of um, discovery, uh, discovering some, um, some phenomena, we observe that even as we build um, design and build these new machines. We need new theories. Uh, we need, uh, you know, uh, various types of uh, new materials. Uh, we need new types of uh, uh, computing uh, disciplines in order to uh, advance to the next stage. You know, quantum being one of them, but you know, quantum computing is not is on uh, one hand it's very promising, but on the other hand, it's extremely limited in its application, at least for the time, at least at least now. Not because it's you don't have too many qubits. There are fundamental uh, uh, limitations in quantum that um, uh, renders it fairly, um, I would say, uh, not no, not very competent compared to standard computing as much as people believe. So we need to break a barrier. In order to do that, we need uh, certainly studies in, in science of computing, and that's what we do at, at my center. 
but of course, you need lots of uh, engineering uh, to build Fugaku, um, which is Mount Fuji, by the way. Um, you need uh, it involves you know, thousands of people, and I'm only only fortunate to represent all the efforts. And and you know, at some degree, um, all supercomputers have the kind of uh, involvement from all the engineers to design, build, and you know, run and maintain a machine. So there are a lot of uh, engineering and technology involved. And um, uh, But I think what makes this field exciting is um, the machine itself in terms of being a computer science artifact and engineering artifact, but also the science being done on these machines also broaden the scope of uh, our uh, scientific knowledge. So uh, I think that's what really makes uh, this field really exciting. It's a fantastic blend of science and uh, technology and engineering. Yeah, it is a very exciting field, and obviously it's one that's going to have great growth in the future, which brings us to the next question from the public for you, Professor Mengerson. Someone has written in saying, I'm really interested in supercomputers. What should I study, and can I use this in any field of science? Uh, so I think, as, as has been said, uh, there is a, if, you, if to study supercomputers, then it certainly has to be used in almost every area of science. Uh, I can't really think of an area of science where where it would not be useful to know the basics of computing and then to know about the supercomputers. And I guess to uh, to learn about supercomputers, then, or to learn about computing, then you have uh, the computer science degrees and the uh, the data science degrees now. And so the data science is really bringing together the mathematical and statistical sciences with the machine learning and AI and computer sciences and information sciences and the e-research through the professional infrastructure uh, where a lot of the, uh, the knowledge of the supercomputers comes in, which brings the engineering side of it. And you combine then the domain science. And so the areas to which these can, this uh, knowledge can be translated. And so we see that there is this blend of um, of uh, skills uh, that, are, that are required uh, for for understanding um, this technology, and it's not just about then the build, but it's also about the application. But you can come at this from different areas. So if you haven't uh, studied, uh, you know, computer science as uh, as your uh, you know at a university straight out of school, we're very fortunate. In, in Australia and in many other countries that we can come to university later, we can study as mature age students, we can change direction in our, in our um, area of, um, of interest and training, we can come back to second training and we often see people coming into this area uh, who have previous lives and previous skills and I think that's what's really then beneficial to bring that new knowledge and those different uh, ways of thinking into an area. And we really see this in data science and uh, and then we can then work with the, um, the engineers in actually building then machines and supercomputers that are going to answer the kinds of problems that we want to address uh, in these different domain areas. I think that was a, a great answer, that it, it involves a blend of skills and a multidisciplinary approach. Um, just the last question from our viewer, Professor Mengerson. They're asking, in what ways has the COVID-19 pandemic broken down international research barriers? I think the COVID-19 pandemic has been something that has affected everybody. It's affected everybody at uh, in every country. So if you look at any level in any country, you know, if it's at a government level, if it's at a business level, if it's at a at a social level, if it's at a personal level, every uh, one has been affected and every country has been affected. And as this has rolled out throughout the year, it has come at us, at us from such a pace or with such a pace and from such different directions that we're all in this together. And I think one of the things that we've seen is that at a, at a really fundamental level, we've needed to tackle this uh, internationally, globally, in order to be able to resolve it. And so it's been one of the real imperatives that we can't, you know, we, we do have our national boundaries and our national borders, but we've had 
take an international approach to learning about this and to be able to respond to it. And so it really has broken down the boundaries in that way. And hopefully then this will be a model for the future in order to be able to solve international problems um, at, this, um, at this sort of collaborative level. So I really believe at, at all levels, uh, from the individual through to the government, uh, the pandemic has really brought us together in that way, in that we have to work together to be able to resolve these global issues. Yeah, I'd certainly agree with you. We've all learned a lot this year, especially scientifically. And uh, thank you for that explanation. Now that brings us to the end of our event. Thank you to our speakers, distinguished Professor Kerry Mangerson, Professor Satoshi Matsuoka, and Dr. Dae Yon Chow. We really appreciate your time. Such important work is being done by you all and thousands of scientists around the globe. Thank you also to everyone around the world who have joined us online. We hope you will continue to join us for the rest of the webinars in this series over the coming months. I'm Michelle Tapper from the Australian Academy of Science. Good night. Good night. Thank you. Science matters to all of us. We're living in science. We're a world that's driven by science. A world without science would be a desolate sort of place. No technology, no electricity, no travel, no planes, no medicine. A good scientist is someone who can ask a really good question. Once you've answered it, it will have an impact on all sorts of other fields. With science, you're trying to uncover something no one else has ever managed to discover. I think the moment of discovery is a really interesting moment. The point where you realise that you're studying something that could be profoundly interesting and you can almost taste the discovery. It's the biggest buzz you can imagine, the aha moment. It's like, oh my God, we've got it. We live in a world of extraordinary challenges. The solutions to those challenges are more science and technology, not less. If the public have a deeper understanding of science, that allows them to make more informed choices about the way they live their lives, the way they interact with the planet, and being healthier, which ultimately impacts their families and their communities. The future doesn't happen to us. We get to decide. Those decisions will be about how we best use technology and science to solve the very many problems that are facing us. We have come a really long way in scientific discovery and innovation over the last hundred years, even in the last decade. But there is still so much that we don't know. The beauty of the universe. Understanding the basic building blocks of life. The beauty of how things work. With science, you can solve problems. With science, you can make discoveries that none of us could ever have imagined.